First Spin. Welcome to First Spin, a show where I learn how to use the parallax propeller without having any prior programming experience. And rather than do this on my own, I have enlisted the help of two experts. Whisker and Roy. Whisker and yep. Roy. Roy and Whisker. If you guys don't know that by this many episodes. Well, well you know, it kind of depends back to the because maybe over. some people like they come in the middle, you know, because they're like, yay, today we're going to talk about the accelerometer. I don't know much about accelerometers. I might as well, might as well learn. So welcome yeah. to the show. Any newbies? Those people are missing out if they haven't listened from the very beginning. <laughs> there's, a, there's a good narrative element to the show. I think so. Following along as Eddie goes from knowing absolutely nothing to... to uh, being able to talk with the big boys. Being able to... Uh, talk uh, shop. Uh, uh, <laughs> program. Code. Yeah. Wire okay. things up. Yeah. Whiskers. She's actually written some code on her own that works. I, I can say that much. <laughs> it, <laughs> it actually it works. works. It's not pretty, but it works. It's not elegant. It's not efficient, but when by Jove. Down, when it comes down to it, though, what matters is that it actually achieves the function you wanted it to achieve. So Actually, I, I will say, so <laughs> last week you guys heard about this, but this week I'll just repeat it. Uh, I've been all the modules that we've been going over in first spin, which is pretty much most of the ones available on uh, from Parallax, I think, or Kickstart. Uh, I've been trans making them, so I've been studying them, and then I've been making them work wirelessly with XB modules. With XB modules, and you know, I I gotta say, I am still very proud of that <laughs> <laughs> because I don't think anybody else has. You know, not all of them. Yeah. Not mean, all of them. Not all of them. I'm sure people, people have done some of them here and there. But well, they've you've had through to and, for the bots. It's made keep a wireless. in mind that most yeah. people don't have every single module. Yeah. <laughs> let alone the free time to make them all wireless. Free time. Yeah. This was working time. Yeah, I suppose. Working woman's time. Well, for a lot of other people, it would be their free time because it's their hobby, right? Yeah. So, I but I'm I'm still quite proud of it. I don't know what the next step is because you know after you finish a big project, you're kind of you kind of look around and you're like, "All right, what now? <laughs> what, well, see, what's my next project?" So far, you've mostly just you know made the True. sensors or input just devices work, or whatever period. work, right? But you need to like make them make put them you know, together something useful out of maybe a combination of them. You know what I'm thinking? You know the accelerometer and how it can how it's supposed to be able to detect motion and vibration and such like that yeah you remember in the rock the movie the rock oh, where yeah, they enter this open before where they enter up, up through the shower like system mm -hmm. and like they have that little dome ball thing with like a little a little dangly earring bit and like when when the marines the move it sensor yeah when the marines move it it like goes off alarming the bad guys that the Marines are in. Yeah, right. the same technology is used in pinball machines to detect tilt. Oh. Yep. I see. I've only ever really honestly paid, played pinball on the PC. <laughs> You've missed out then. I know. And whenever I do that tilt thing, it always screws up my game. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. If we're so, in the Pacific Northwest, we know to go. I know. To a place with a lot of good machines. Yes, it's true. Yeah. So anyway, as you can tell, today we are going to be talking about the accelerometer, and I will actually have more questions on this module than I have had in previous modules, because the other ones were pretty uh, self-explanatory, I think. And yeah. By yeah. self, you mean Whisker and Roy explanatory? <laughs> kind of. I mean, like, I could get most of it. I could understand most of, like, the results and, like, what well, they meant and such. Most of the rest of them have fairly simple interfaces as well. Right. They make it easy because they do a lot of the work for you. Right, right. Um, but today, again, Memzik 2125 Dual Axis Accelerometer. We're going to start by going to learn.parallax.com. Uh, to the kickstarts, and we are going to go ahead and go through, well, what it's supposed to do. So it's supposed to be able to measure tilt in two axes, forward and back, or side to side. Um, yeah, let, let's stop there for a second. Yeah. It, measuring tilt is, is really an application of it. 
Okay. Like you can you can read its values and infer the tilt from it. Okay. What it's actually measuring is acceleration on those two axes. And because you're always in a constant state of acceleration due to gravity, mm -hmm. um, that's what it's measuring all the time. And so if it's not actually moving but just tilting, you can, because of gravity pulling down on it, essentially, you can, you can measure the tilt based on the two axes uh, because of the direction that gravity is pulling on it. Okay. Right. So if you turn, if you hold the module flat, gravity is pulling down and it's in the middle of both axes. So mm -hmm. they won't actually measure any value. They'll be in their center state. Mm -hmm. But if you tilt it all the way to one side, then that axis will be pulled all the way in one direction and it'll register as one G of motion in that direction. Sure. Right. And if you tilt it all the way the other way, you'll get, you know, one G in the other direction and it, you know, there's the four different directions you can tilt. And okay. you put it in, in between us and Sol, our star, uh, at the point where the gravitational pull of the sun is equal to the gravitational pull of the earth. And then on that axis between the two on the sensor, it'll read as not being pulled at all. Right. So if yeah. you were to actually get all the way up in space in orbit way up there, you know, where there's no gravity affecting you from Earth, and the gravity from the sun is well, still affecting equal. you, but it's they're countered yeah. it's somewhere way up there. If you like, shoot yeah. it up in the air in a model rocket, and it starts to free fall, the acceleration is going to go to zero as well. Oh, that's right. cool. Because it counters. So you got to remember, we're talking about acceleration and not velocity. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. So if you're actually moving the module then it's hard for it to also get the tilt. So like if you were in a car, mm -hmm. getting the tilt from it will be slightly less accurate because you're moving in a direction as well and you'd have to factor that in. Well, it's mm. not going to be any less accurate. It's just going to be more complicated because you have more than well, one um, uh, well, vector acceleration going on at the same time. Right. Well, it'll be slightly less accurate just because of the two vectors pulling it off axis and your precision is more or less affected by the by that. Now, you can but, counteract this using other sensors, but you're getting right. complicated stuff there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then it says here, it registers sudden changes in motion as well as detecting small amounts of vibration and motion. Is that just because it's so sensitive? Right. So okay. it's got a little tiny uh, MEMS. We've kind of covered this before, but it's like a little piece of material floating on a, on a MEMS surface I material. Think it sounds like, like an like air a bubble or something. Well, it's like, it's like if you had a sheet of paper and you put a weight in the middle. Yeah. Right or a sheet of elastic paper, right? Yeah. You put a weight in the middle, yeah. But shrink that down really tiny, yeah. Microscopic, um, and then the material has is uh, resist. You know, it's piezo material, so it has resistive changes mm. based on its bending and tweaking. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what it, and and so if you tap it right or there's vibrations those are actually slight amounts of acceleration in different directions mm -hmm. than down and it's sensitive enough that you can actually measure you know that so you could actually put this on a board and measure tapping and right. count the number of taps right? right or something like that as long as you get the thresholds right because when i was running this there is like some natural variation yeah, there's a little bit of noise in the system. You're constantly going to have a slight amount of, you know, plus or minus a few mm -hmm. digits, of, you know. It's value. an earthquake. You're in Minnesota. <laughs> and if Parallax wants to donate a pile of these, I will happily put them into <laughs> um, keyboard keys and create the most sensitive oh, uh, uh, velocity overkill. keyboard ever. That's overkill. I'll totally do it. Overkill. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. So, so then the measurements. So, okay. Uh, for those who don't know, it gives you, um, an X value and a Y value, and right. so these X and Y values are actually a measurement of the G force. Um. Yeah. So let's back up again a little bit. The actual module is mm -hmm. outputting a pulse 
signal on the two pins, one for the x-axis and one for the y-axis. Okay. And the pulse is just going at a constant 100 megahertz or 100 hertz rate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the, the size of the pulse. Mm -hmm. So you have your, your, it goes high, stays up for a little while, then goes back to low and then stays down and comes back up. Mm -hmm. That period is the 100 hertz rate. And then the length of the pulse being high is how much away from the center that axis is being pulled. So you said 100 hertz? Yeah. It goes at 100 hertz updating that pulse. The pulse okay. is outputting at 100 hertz. So, so what you see then is the pulse width? That would actually be audible, by the like way. The measurement is... The yeah, measurement so that you get in the serial terminal is the actual pulse width. Right. It's it's a unit that I, I'm not sure how much it's scaled in the in the PASM driver there, but it's basically something related to the amount of ticks it counted the pulse being high, right? Oh. For that axis. And so it's the size of that pulse. So it's kind of like the inverse of driving a servo or other device that where you're outputting a pulse to create something. Right. This is creating a pulse and feeding it back to you and you can use that to determine you know, if the pulse is very short, it's leaning all the way one way, and if the pulse is very long, it's leaning all the way the other way. Okay. And that's that's the low-level output of this module is just those two pulses. So then what you're doing in the code is timing those pulses, and that gives you a number of how much it was in one direction or the other, right? And the... You know the all the different ways that you can interpret that is how you get things like tilt or acceleration in a direction or tapping or vibrations okay. right okay so let's actually back up even more and we'll just talk about the hardware first that's okay? <laughs> okay um so there are six pins it's like this super tiny little like like i don't know my my pinky fingernail size maybe even <laughs> maybe even smaller um and let me see here. Actually, I don't know if there's a pin out on this. There is on the kickstart. Oh, there is. Okay. Yeah. So there is T out, which is not which connected. Is, that's the, actually the temperature. Like oh. with most of these kind of accelerometers, they have an internal temperature reading. Mm -hmm. And because the temperature can affect the results of a MEMS reading mm -hmm. if you want the best accuracy you need to factor in that temperature output i see and you don't need to connect it for most cases because you can just you know it'll vary a little bit based on temperature but in general you can still tell that it's tilting one way or the other way appropriate it just won't be quite as accurate okay um so then t out that's for temp and then y out is for the y output which right. again is a variable pulse width right. that always goes at 100 hertz or right. otherwise known as 100 cycles per second. And that output is what you get, which is representative of like the G-forces, right. the acceleration so if, forces. So if the pulse is evenly high and low, meaning it's got a 50% duty cycle, mm -hmm. then it will... That means it's in the center. It's level. Right. It's level. Yeah. On that axis. Okay. Okay. And then we've got the VSS uh, three and four are pins three and four are both uh, for ground. And so I think you can put either to ground and it'll work. Right. And yeah. Then, they're, they're one or the other. You don't need both. Right. And then X out is just the X output. Um, and then VDD, it can be 3.3 or 5 volts. Right. So very convenient to use on the prop BOE. Right. Um, and I think actually on the prop BOE, like depending on what kind of board you have, you might need resistors. But because this is the prop BOE, I didn't need to have any. So yeah, you you need the resistors for the for the uh, basic, basic stamp. stamp. Yeah. But not for the prop BOE. Huzzah. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. And so then I guess we can go through the. Was there anything I was missing from the explanation of what these do? I don't think so. No. Unless you you have a question. I mean, well, I'm trying if to you're think about sure, it because then... G forces to me are somewhat mm, confusing. 
<laughs> well, one G is the force of gravity. So that's like if you're just the standing force on of the ground. gravity on Earth yeah. at sea level, blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. Well, there's there's variance, but one G is generally that okay. um, you're technically you're probably at like one point oh one three two or, you know, some amount of G plus or minus mm -hmm. around the one, depending on where you're at on the Earth. Mm -hmm. But one is close enough. To equal not moving, just standing there on the earth, mm -hmm. you're being accelerated by gravity. So 2G is two times that. So you would feel twice as heavy, twice as much force pulling you down. Like so after I like, eat Eddie's goulash. Yeah. Right. That's mass. Or not if I were like. But hey. <laughs> well, I'm not now, sure. now, if you're in an airplane, mm -hmm. say like the vomit comet. Uh, which is the airplane that they use to simulate low gravity or zero mm. near zero gravity by doing hyperbolic uh, paths through the air. Yeah. Um, when it's going up on its steep slope up, mm -hmm. you will feel extra G's down. I don't know what it gets to mm -hmm. at the peak, mm -hmm. um, but you'll feel a little bit of extra force against you. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when it, when it gets up to the top of the hyperbolic, peak it's going you know you you are getting the opposite g you're basically falling right and you feel like you're in zero gravity so it's basically like the one g is canceled out right right and then when it gets to the other side of the the peak and it gets to the you know it starts pulling out yeah of that mm -hmm. then you get the the extra g's on you and I you see. feel heavier than normal i see right Okay. And so then you're going up, you know, into the positive, maybe even two, three, four Gs. Okay. Okay. So it's it's all very relative. It's uh your what you're feeling is, you know, the G forces and that's, you know, the comparison between, you know, the velocity that you've got or the uh trajectory that you have, uh, and uh the changes that you're making versus other, you know, accelerations that are being placed on you. And it's basically like uh high school physics stuff you know newtonian physics right okay got it um okay so then in the code uh we have full duplex serial as our serial terminal interface um and then we have an object the memsic 2125 which i think is in the library but i can't be certain um yeah. if you don't have it though you can always download it from the kickstart um, and I looked at it just to see if there's anything I could understand from it, and it was pretty much mostly PASM, so I kind of backed away from that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just doing the measurement of the the pulse, and it's using PASM so that it can get a very accurate measurement, so right. you get you get better, reliable, you know, accurate results from your tests. Right. Sort your of measurement. application that really benefits from having the... Uh... Uh, what do you call it? Uh, the deterministic timing capabilities, right? Of the prop. Okay, that makes sense. Because measuring those pulse widths, you know, That's each one big... fits within a uh, uh, hundred hertz. Yeah. So right. yeah, that's pretty that's very... pretty small space. I mean, the prop can go a lot faster than that, but you want to be able to slice it up into a lot of little slices so that you've got better accuracy. Right. Um, then we have our typical crystal details and then x in is zero y in is one those are setting the pins and at first i was confused i was like why is x in zero y in one and then i realized i have a question about the uh oh, it's in the, con the section. object section there yeah or rather the con section what's up um is the driver for this particular sensor smart in the sense of what um uh, clock mode and uh, X in freak you're using, or does it need to um, be past that in an initialization? Or we'll see when in so in normal uh, uh, propeller code, uh, if your top module, the top thing that you actually compile, uh, has the clock mode and X in frequency, then that's what will get set for all of them. So the modules that you include will just be using the top modules frequency. I was asking settings. if the code was smart enough right. to know. The, yeah, I was just explaining that. And then the code in the Memsic 
object is just assuming that it's uh, running at the high clock rate. So um, it's not then. It well, it 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 basically is really uh, just reading um, the the pins and using weight PNE and weight PEQ type stuff. So it doesn't really need to uh, care about the clock rates that much, from what I can tell. It's not basing its math all, all according to the crystal. It's it has to be. Um. Well, I, I haven't. An, I I, I don't know. I haven't it that. analyzed okay. that code very closely. What if anybody knows? I was just wondering if it would be okay to use a different crystal without having to change any of the code. But uh, Roy hasn't dug into it there, so I'll drop we'll, it. We'll we'll figure it out. Show's not about my questions, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good question. I mean, that's I, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know that it uses the counter modules to do this reading of these pins. Mm -hmm. Um, and those are somewhat independent, but they still based off of, uh, you know, the, the, the system clocks. So. I ask on this one because it's, uh, it's very, because, um, of harmonic timings, it would, there, there's a lot of code tricks that you could pull in the PASM to take advantage of, um, the 100 Hertz being, you know, uh, a harmonic of the, Five megahertz. Of okay, the, so uh, the clock. So, so yeah. I, I I'm looking at the code now, and it actually factors in clock frequency in a couple places. So, oh. so it it does oh. know how to change itself to adjust for using different speeds. Yeah, it, it it appears to have like a scale and an offset based on the clock frequency, which would help factor that in. So, so for homework, everybody set your clock speed to be RC and way slower than 100 megahertz or 100 hertz just to see <laughs> how absolutely ridiculous your results are. Oh, boy. Yeah. Okay, I'm done interrupting. Okay. <laughs> and then we have our function. Uh, we start the serial terminal, and then we initialize the memzig2125 by letting it know which pins to, I guess, uh, look yeah, at. It's, it's which pins for the X and the Y. Right. Axis, yeah. And then it's got some var local variables, X and Y, which uh, the X axis and Y axis outputs go to. Mm -hmm. And then those are divided by 100. I'm assuming for uh, like decimal accuracy. Because well, there's no it, it, floating. It's just that, yeah, it's just that the numbers coming out of the, the MEMSIC module are the raw numbers. And mm -hmm. they're very big because it's based on your clock rate, mm -hmm. right? So on the propeller, you're running at 80 megahertz, and you're getting pretty large numbers for the values. So it's just dividing by 100, so they'll be down in a a little more close to the precision of the device okay. range. Okay. And then, uh, so we're sending them, doing some tabbing, new line with 13, and then waiting, and then repeating yeah. uh, that whole reading X and Y axis. Right, and this this particular sample code is going at a pretty slow rate. It's only reading it every half second. Well, that's pretty fast. <laughs> well, when I looked it, at it, it's able to, but it's yeah, going a, it's going a hundred times a second in the hardware internally, right on right. the sensor, and this is only reading it half a second once every half second. Yeah. The raw values now the PASM code in the module is reading it continuously, mm -hmm. but this code is only displaying the results every half second. Right. So to give you an idea, the PASM code is churning away at uh, what what would you what's it set to full blast eighty megahertz? Yeah, eighty megahertz. Eighty megahertz. So as fast as it can check to see if that pin is on or not, and it's keeping track how often it's on for the stretch of a uh, uh, one hundred hertz um, period of time, mm -hmm. and then it's uh, parsing that a little bit to make it uh, pullable by the main code. And the main code is only bothering to look at it once every half second, half of a second. second. Yep. Right. That's pretty funny. Yep. So yeah, it's your just... code could go a lot faster if you were using it to do something and you wanted it to sense changes a lot faster. Yep. Right. So um, I ran this code and when it was level, X and Y were about 4,000. Um, when I tilted it forward, X went to like 3,000. And I, when I tilted it backwards, X went to 5,000. 
rough, or, yeah. rough, like give or take. And then mm-hmm. the same thing um, when I tilted it left, the Y value became three thousand, and when I tilted it right, the Y value became five thousand. So it almost it's almost like the range was three thousand to five thousand, with four thousand being level. Right, and that's just you know the particular clock frequency will determine those numbers so if you if you happen to run it at a higher or lower clock rate or your processor that you're using this with works at a different rate then you would get different numbers mm-hmm. it's just you know counting uh clocks or or cycles and so, so to make so- this useful in terms of uh g's you would have to have some sort of scale that you apply it to and you'd probably need some sort of settling you know, right. you'd let it calibrate itself as it was setting still. Mm-hmm. And then you'd have a good idea of what its normal up-down acceleration was, and you could go from there. Okay. Right. So then, right. and this is actually what I thought, originally thought the gyroscope should show. Because <laughs> remember, like, <laughs> but, I was like, well, why does it keep going back to zero? I want to see the difference. So right. it's actually the accelerometer that shows the difference between level and... Um, right. Right the difference but in terms when, of g's be, but only because it's showing you the acceleration of gravity and like i said if you're only if you're only tilting it then you will get the mm-hmm. values based on the tilt mm-hmm. if you were to move it to the side and and tilt it you would get values in both axes or you know different it would change the values um okay so you would have to factor that in somehow you know you'd have to know what's going on and that's how that's one of those cases where if you have a gyroscope and an accelerometer you can tell whether the diff whether it's a tilt or a, a movement because the accelerometer doesn't know which one it is the gyro will tell you it actually is a rotation because it gives you the rate of rotation change right whereas if you just move a gyro sideways mm-hmm. you're not going to get a rotation from that on the axis that the accelerometer is going to be moving and telling you there's a movement in that direction, right? So if I move it left or right, because this this time I was rotating it left and rotating it right, right. like seesaw you, style. But like if I move this, obviously the gyroscope won't be able to tell what it's doing. It'll still say zero zero because I'm not rotating it. The accelerometer, however, will give me different information. Uh-huh. Right, because it'll measure the acceleration going to the right or going to the left. But it'll be pretty short-lived. Right. It'll be similar to what you experience with the gyroscope. Okay. If you move it to the right, it'll give you a short blip of acceleration, but then as soon as you stop, it goes back to no acceleration. In that okay. Whereas if you rotate the accelerometer, you're actually going to see a change in the two axes until you change it back. Because right. you've got that constant acceleration of gravity, which is pulling both of them. Right. Mm. Okay. And a gyroscope will probably give you some kind of reading when you move it to the right, but it won't be on the axis that is the same as the motion. Mm-hmm. So, so that's how you factor them together, is that you take the same axis on the gyroscope and the same axis on the accelerometer. And if, if you, the gyroscope says you're rotating... Then mm-hmm. you can use the accelerometer's gravity constant change to measure a tilt. But if the gyroscope says you're not rotating, then the accelerometer means your readings will mean that you're moving instead of tilting. Hmm. So that's how they work together to help you do more elaborate things to detect, you know, for your, say, your quadcopter or a helicopter or plane to detect tilt versus motion. And do all these things happen in tandem, like, or is there? Do you have to do it where it reads the gyroscope if the gyroscope is? Well, you would rotated. read them both, and using some like math, and like a boolean something. Well, no, using much oh. more complicated math that is a bad word to Addy. <laughs> <laughs> Common filters, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's Kalman filters and there's a few other no. techniques um, that you can use to fuse the data together and get you know combined results. Um, but uh, you know you can Basically do more math. S- hmm. Yeah, um, 
and logic because you could do it all with just going okay i'm gonna i'm reading the accelerometer and the gyroscope and the accelerometer says i'm moving to the left mm -hmm. potentially you, you can or, do a lot of thresholding stuff too if you're not interested right. in super specific detail you're just like okay i moved left uh, that kind right of thing. and that's probably or, what you'd be doing knowing right. me now we're out of time guys and Alrighty. uh if if Everyone out there is pretty comfortable with this, um, these concepts. That's awesome. But I just want to remind everybody that you're sitting on the surface of a sphere that's rotating thousands of miles an hour and orbiting <laughs> around a star that uh, that is like hundreds and thousands of miles an hour is that uh, orbit. And then the star itself is moving. Ugh, who knows how fast some astrophysicist. And that's all vectors. And you are moving that fast. You're just not accelerating so you don't feel it i yeah. hope you all feel like you're gonna fall off the face of this little ball now <laughs> <laughs> all right that's it for us you can catch us every tuesday evening at firstspin.tv there's an rss feed there you can set up your phone or music player to automatically download us every week uh our uh, uploads may be a little bit spotty for the next couple of weeks as Roy is getting ready to move up to the Pacific Northwest yep. for his yep. new job at Valve. Yep. yep. But if you guys have any ideas for what we should talk about when we uh, do start going regular again, just let us know. Yep. That's it for us for this week. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. See ya.